What's up, Scandalites and Says So Squad? This is Ashley with Ashley Says So, and I am back with another Old Hollywood Scandals video. And hold on, y'all, because I want to do a dramatic intro for this one, okay? <clears throat> Before there was Chadwick Boseman, there was Will Smith. Before Will Smith, there was Denzel Washington. Before Denzel Washington, there was Howard Rollins. That's right, Howard Rollins is our person of interest. And I keep wanting to say Howard Rollins, but apparently it was Howard Rollins. If I say Howard Rollins, y'all know what I mean. So come on, let's get to it. Howard Ellsworth Rollins Jr. was born October the 17th in 1950. He was the youngest of four children born to Ruth and Howard Ellsworth Rollins Sr. in Baltimore, Maryland. As a child, nothing significant happened in Howard's life. He just attended school and grew up like he was supposed to. And when he got to college, he went to Townsend University and he studied theater. In theater though, Howard stood out because he was much more talented than his peers. As a matter of fact, his talent was so great that he got a gig very early on. And in 1970, he left college to play the role of Slick in a soap opera called Our Street. After this, he moved to New York where he appeared in several Broadway productions and even on Broadway, he was sort of a standout. And he quickly booked the film role in the film called Ragtime in 1981. And that is a good movie. If y'all have not seen Ragtime, go look it up and go watch it. I loved it. And, 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 it's not only me that thought it was a good movie. The Academy thought so as well, which is why he was nominated for an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. He also had two Golden Globe nominations. The following year, he had an appearance in the show called Another World, and this appearance too was a standout. He was nominated for a Daytime Emmy Award, but his absolute best role came in 1984, and baby, that is when he played in a soldier story. Honey, if Howard didn't get those tears rolling down your face on that movie, then you don't have no feelings, you ain't got no heart. If you ain't seen a soldier story, Put your address in the comments so I can come over there and slap you and run away before y'all pull the gun out. Seriously though, y'all, I'm serious. That is an excellent movie. Everybody needs to watch it. Howard Rollins, David Allen Greer, Denzel Washington, Adolph Caesar, all of these people gave great performances. That movie is one of my all time favorites. And funny enough, Howard did not get any accolades or any awards for this role, but it did lead to his biggest role yet. And that is because Carol O'Connor saw a soldier story and he was so moved by Howard's performance that he wanted him to have the role of Virgil Tibbs in In the Heat of the Night. And so at this point, Howard Rollins cannot move wrong. Everything is going right in his life. I mean, I don't even think he had to audition for In the Heat of the Night because of Carol O'Connor. I think he just basically walked up and took the part. Well, 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 hold on, hold on. Let me take that back because Howard said he hesitated on taking the part because he felt like he himself was probably not good enough for that role. I don't know why he felt that way, but he said he did not want to bring the whole cast down because he wasn't talented enough to carry his role. Clearly, the guy was wrong about the whole thing. He carried the role. Some would even say he carried that show with his acting ability. Anyway, whatever reservations he had, he put them aside and he did accept the role of Virgil Tibbs. But child, let me tell you, before they can even get three to four episodes out, the cracks started to show in Howard's life. So in the heat of the night premiered in 1988, and it was in March 1988 that something crazy happened. Let me tell you the story, honey. So everybody, all cast and crew, they're down in Louisiana because this is where they were filming the show at that time, okay? After filming one day, everybody goes to their room. Everybody except Howard, that is. Because it appears that before he made it to his room, he made a stop and found somebody that was selling some cocaine, honey. And when he got the cocaine, instead of going to his room and staying there for the night, he decided to leave back out of the room and go take a joyride or something. I don't know where the man was going. But wherever he was going, he got clocked by a state trooper going 100 miles per hour. Child, you know how that went. Whoop, whoop. Pulled his little tail over real quick, told him to roll down the window. Soon as he rolled down the window, they can tell that something wasn't right. They knew that he was high. Told him to step out of the car, which he did with no hesitation, okay? I guess he just knew he was caught. Told him to take off his jacket. And first they went through searching the car and everything. Everything was fine. Baby, when they opened their jacket, they said Howard had all kind of pockets just full of cocaine, baby. 
cocaine just everywhere. So they took his little tail on into the jailhouse and I don't know if he made bun or whatever, but I do know he was released. But in November of that same year, he pleaded guilty to possession of cocaine and speeding and driving while intoxicated. He was placed on two years probation and fined $4,275. Now, two of the producers on the show wanted to let him go right then. They felt like, eh, you know what? He's about to be a problem. Like, we don't even wanna deal with it, let's fire him. But the third producer was like, no, let him stay. And that was Carol O'Connor himself. He was basically having an argument saying, you know, that's just a mistake. He made a mistake, let's give him a chance. It's not going to help him if we fire him. That's just gonna make him throw his life away. So let's give him a chance to straighten himself out. And keeping Howard spelled great success for the show and Howard himself. I mean, the show was a knockout and it went sky high from the gate. Also, Carol O'Connor and everybody else is very pleased by the decision that he makes because for the next couple of years, Howard wrote Rollins is unstoppable. I mean, the man can cry on cue. He can convey emotions with his eyes. Like he just has everything down pat and he really, really helped carry that show. Now I'm not trying to take anything away from any of the other cast members. I'm really not because everybody was great. But what I'm saying is that that show may not have been successful as it was without Howard E. Rollins to help get it off the ground. He really was a dynamic actor. And everybody can see this man star just rising, but for all the good reviews and pats on the back that Howard was getting, he just could not keep himself on the straight and narrow. And this was because Howard had a little secret. The first secret is that Howard had not given up cocaine. In fact, he was pretty much sniffing it almost every day. Also, along with cocaine, he was now drinking alcohol. Now, the second reason is allegedly Matter of fact, everything from here on out is allegedly, okay? But the second reason, he's not doing the cocaine and drinking because he just wants to party and have fun. No, 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 that's not it. He's doing that because he's battling the fact that he's a gay man. Actually, you know what, let me rephrase that. I don't think he's battling the fact that he's a gay man. He's battling the fact that he cannot show the world what he is. I do believe that he accepted the fact that he was gay, okay? Possibly even that he wanted to be a woman. I'm gonna tell you why that is in a minute. But he's battling that. He's battling that he cannot be that in everyday life. And he's basically living his life in the world as a straight heterosexual man, and he cannot be what he truly knows he is on the inside. And I'm saying all this because reportedly a friend of his said that Howard liked to get high, okay? He liked to get high, he liked to get drunk, and then he liked to dress up as a woman. And this is something right here that Howard would apparently never do if he was sober. Because if he was sober, he had to confront the fact that he most likely felt like a coward. He was scared to show the world what he was because he was scared of everything that he might lose. I mean, how could he come out as a gay man or a cross-dressing man walking the streets as a woman? How could he do that if he portrayed on television to millions of people that he was a straight, macho, heterosexual man, a cop? He was a man on TV that women looked up to uh, wanting to model their husbands after him. He was a man on TV that children look up to wanting their fathers to be like him. How could he come out and say that he was gay or a cross-dresser? He just couldn't do it, at least not at this moment. But when he drank and did drugs, this gave him courage to be what he was and to dress like what he felt like he should dress like. And when I say cross-dressing, I'm not talking about just throwing on a wig and being done with it. Oh, uh, no ma'am. I'm talking about the full regalia. A friend of his said that Howard had black, blonde, brunette wigs, all different sorts of colors. He would put those on. He also had a house full of gowns, some even ball gowns, just a whole bunch of formal, beautiful dresses that he would put on with his wigs and he would get in front of the mirror. I'm sure he had on high heels too. I mean, might as well put on the whole thing, right? So I'm pretty sure he had that on, but he would get in front of the mirror and he would just, you know, model and murmur to himself, I'm a woman. I'm a woman. And this whole spectacle was something that was very, very deep to Howard. Because again, the friend said this would calm him. If he was having a bad day, if he was stressed out about something, coming home and putting on his full dress and his wigs and everything else would calm him. Just standing in front of the mirror, looking at himself like this 
would comb him. Now, even though Howard is at home doing this and being this way, on the show, he is still doing a superb job. Everything is still coming together for him. And then it's like he started to sabotage his career. For instance, his drug use gets heavier and heavier, and eventually this catches up to him and he gets arrested again for drinking and driving. And again, he is not fired from the show because once again, Carol O'Connor steps in for him. Carol O'Connor basically loves him and wants to help him because his own son is battling with drug addiction. He also played a character on In the Heat of the Night. I'm gonna put a picture of him up there. But he also battled with drug addiction and he lost his battle in the year of 1995. But anyways, this story is not about him. But this is why I believe Carol O'Connor has such a soft spot for Howard Rollins. Also, he knows that Howard has a great talent. So he's like, Let, I'm not gonna help him throw it away. That's probably what he wants to do, but, but I'm not going to help him do that. So he's not gonna be getting fired today, not this time. But what Carol O'Connor didn't know is that no matter how much he tried to save Howard, he could not save Howard from himself. So when Howard got arrested again for the same thing, and this time he had to spend a month in jail, at this point, Carol was like, I, I don't know what else to do. There's nothing else I can do. Also, the other producers are getting mad at me now, like, okay, we got to fire you. And so they did, they let him go. And of course, I'm simplifying it for this video because I don't have all of the details, but I do know that it wasn't just this simple. I mean, Howard had racked up at least four or five arrests over a five year period, like just racking them up. And after he got fired, they didn't just cut him off like that. They actually had him coming back to do guest roles, guest spots on In the Heat of the Night. And he even had to get fired from that. He had no choice but to get fired because the town that he was getting arrested in, which is the town they were shooting in, they banned Howard from the town. They're like, okay, wait a minute. You getting arrested too many times. Every time you come down here, you want to get arrested. Like you want to have drugs, alcohol. What is wrong with you, sir? And another reason they banned him is because the townspeople started to complain. They started to have an overflow of out of town drug dealers, people coming from everywhere and bringing their drugs with them because they heard that Howard Rose is on cocaine, he's on drugs, and that he's buying and spending big money. So they're sending their little henchmen down there so they can be ready to sell him their product. And the townspeople are like, da -da -da -da. we got a whole bunch of hoodlums coming in this town. Like, no, something's gonna have to give. And so per the rumor, getting banned and an overflow of drug dealers in this small town was another reason that Howard was fired. And when he got fired, it is said that he pretty much fully embraced himself. Now he felt like it was his time to shine and be the person that he really wanted to be. They said that, that during the daytime, he would be toned down and you know, just dressed like a regular male. But honey, they said at night, baby, they said he used to be snatched. You hear me, honey? Oh baby, they said that he used to be dressed up in his full female finery. He would put on those long flowing dresses, those nice gowns. Sometimes he'd wear feathers. Also, he would wear a face full of makeup and he would hit the gay club scene, honey. They said he was a woman of the night, baby. And he would pick up different men and he would take them home. There's also tell that he was already kind of doing this when he was on In the Heat of the Night. I don't believe that, but I don't know. But I do know that if he was already doing this, it was nothing to the extent of what it was after he was fired. So he's frequenting these gay clubs, he's picking up men, he's dressed in his regalia, and honey, he is a full-blown woman pretty much. He's even going by the swanky name of Turalura Goldfar. That was his name. If you tried it and was like, hey Howard, hey Howard, while he was dressed as a woman, they say he would turn around to you and be like, uh, who, excuse me? Oh, no, 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 honey. The name is Turalura Goldfar. The funny thing about all of this though is that even though Howard was free and basically being himself, he still was getting in trouble over the drugs and alcohol. He still could not leave it alone or would not leave it alone. And now that he was being himself, this spelled bad news for him because now he was getting pulled over and arrested and they said one time he was dressed like Whoopi Goldberg. Another time he was dressed like Tina Turner. This right here set tongues wagging. What is up with Howard Rowland? Oh, he was a private guy. So the public didn't know anything about him really. And then you go from in the heat of the night, they're already wondering why you're going, hmm, what's going on? And then you show up in mugshots dressed and looking like this, looking like a full blown woman. 
Oh yeah, the public had a lot to say. As a matter of fact, the tabloids had a field day. They plastered his mug shots all over, which is crazy though. I keep hearing and reading and people saying, oh yeah, his mug shots were everywhere. But baby, why come when I done the research, I couldn't find that one mug shot? I know the internet wasn't out back then, but baby, I can still find tabloid stuff from like the 1920s, 1910s and have that posted up here. So are you really telling me there's not one mug shot picture of Howard E. Rollins on the internet? Really? But I mean, I guess not. I couldn't find him. Y'all know I searched far and wide, honey. And after this, I mean, he gets a few roles, but this is pretty much how Howard lives out the rest of his life. Now they did say that one point of time, just a short period of time, he did get clean, but that didn't last for long at all. There was also supposedly a time that he went on a talk show dressed like a woman. Do y'all know anything about that? Like seriously, I know it's a shame that I'm supposed to be giving y'all details, but I gotta ask y'all, but I, I, don't, I don't know nothing about that. I couldn't find anything about that. I couldn't find any pictures, any video clips. What talk show did he supposedly go on where he was dressed like a woman? Please let me know because I would love to know. Now, while Howard is out doing his thing, living his life like this, I have no judgments, but I will say that he should have protected himself because even though he never admitted this, as far as I'm concerned, or at least he never admitted this to the media, they say that he contracted HIV and he found out about it six weeks before his death. And the weeks leading up to his death, apparently he was very sickly and in a lot of pain. Let me read you an interview that his neighbor and so-called friend gave right after he passed away. He says, Howard was so sick during the last couple of months that it took me 10 minutes to help him down the stairs. A kidney infection put him into the hospital. Even when he came home, it caused him so much pain that there was times that he could barely walk. He told me a year ago that he was HIV positive, even though he hated to talk about it. Damned AIDS get in the way of everything, he said that Howard said. Howard also told him that the bacteria he had in his stomach had spread throughout his body and there was nothing that he could do about it. So he said that Howard would spend his time sitting in the dark with the shades pulled. He would watch TV or he would telephone people all over the country. He said that Howard's only comfort in recent months had been dressing up. Just weeks before the end, he even joked to pals that he wanted to be buried as a woman in a gold and black beaded cocktail dress with makeup and false eyelashes. And this is still the friend talking. For years, Howard led a secret double life. Dressing up in drag, he'd cruise a Manhattan neighborhood as a girl named Tora Lure Goldfarb. He would purse his lips, put his hand on his hip, and suddenly he'd be transformed into a woman. As a woman, he'd leave all his cares behind. He wasn't a druggie or an AIDS patient. He was a sassy, sexy, temptress. His favorite thing in the whole world was showing off a new outfit to a friend, especially a winter ensemble, like a lady's fur coat over a skirt and stockings. When he was feeling well, he loved to dress in a spectacular women's outfit and go to a transvestite club looking for male lovers. Another neighbor, Art Franco, told Globe Magazine, near the end, the cross-dressing masquerade was just pathetic. The saddest thing I ever saw was when I dropped off some groceries and Howard was eating haagen -Dazs. He was wearing a dress and a blonde wig and watching reruns of his show. Howard said, that's my character, Virgil Tibbs. I'm totally opposite, but damn, I'm so believable. I must be really good at what I do. Art Franco also said that Howard would pose in his gowns in front of a full length mirror, straightening his scene and he also adjusted his false boobs. He had six wigs on stands, four blonde and a brunette and a red head. There were beads strung from doorways and posters from his movies, Rat Time, A Soldier's Story, and Heat. By his bed was a picture of himself, his mom, and his sister Hattie. He told Art, they've always been there for me. I kiss their picture and say God bless mom and sis every night. Art also said that he used to be there when Howard Rollins would cry and he would sob and he would say, I love Carol O'Connor. He was the only man that ever fought for me. And he said that one of the last things that Howard was doing while he was still alive was sitting by the phone waiting for a call asking him to return to In the Heat of the Night. But Art says the call never came. 
The interview goes on to say, as the virus ravaged Howard's body, his neighbor became so worried that he started to visit the stricken actor three times a day. Depressed and lonely, Howard was worn out by the constant hiccups, which was a result of the deadly body infection. Climbing to the actor's loft bedroom at 1 p.m. December the 7th, his neighbor heard a gurgling sound and saw a vision of hell. Howard was stretched out on his back in his bed, gasping for air and staring blankly at the ceiling. The neighbor said, Howard, can you speak? But he didn't respond. The neighbor tried to lift him, but his chest just rattled and he gurgled as though his insides were about to pour out. The neighbor called the paramedics and as the paramedics lifted Howard from the bed, the gurgling sound grew louder and the blood started pouring from his mouth and his nose. He was drowning in it. They stuck tubes down his throat and started pumping the blood out of his lungs into small plastic sacks. It splattered everywhere. The floor was covered in blood. In the end, it was reported that Howard Rollins died from a bacterial infection from septic shock due to complications of lymphoma. They never confirmed the HIV or AIDS rumor, but most people feel like it was the HIV and AIDS that caused the lymphoma. So that is for you guys to believe. I do in fact believe that he had HIV and AIDS, but as I say all the time, that is my personal opinion. What I do know though is all of those horrifying details that I just gave you, those happened on December the 7th. And on December the 8th, Howard Rollins died while he was in the hospital. And again, they said that was from complications of lymphoma. Y'all, that was the end of the Howard E. Rollins story. That was his old Hollywood scandals tale. But now I'm just gonna talk a little bit. I really think that this man sabotaged his career, y'all. I really feel like that he did things that were damaging to himself because of a mental problem that he had when it came to himself. He could not forgive himself that he had not lived his life earlier or maybe he felt like he let some people down or maybe he was just mad at the world because why can I not live my truth and keep my job? Why can I not live my truth and everybody love me for it the same way they claim to love me when I play a heterosexual male? That is what I believe. Please tell me in the comments what you guys feel because this story, I couldn't find any more information on them. That's pretty much all of the information that was out. I know you guys probably came here looking for more, but y'all know I'm not into making up stuff. Like if I don't have it, I just don't have it. I do tell the stories in my way, but that does not mean that I make up any of the details that I say. I just give it a sprinkle of says so. But I do wanna know, what do y'all think? Like there really was not a reason, at least as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I saw, for all of this to happen, for him to start acting that way. Why do you think this man basically started making bad decisions out of nowhere? He went to college, he was on Broadway, he was doing all of this stuff, and on the straight and narrow, then all of a sudden he starts drinking and doing drugs, which I understand that. I do understand that. People get onto drugs for different reasons, but he was always putting himself in positions to get caught by the police. Plenty of people have a habit that they cannot break, but what plenty of people don't do is go do crazy stuff like go drive erratically while they're drunk or high. Like, why was he doing all this stuff? Now, I will say this. I do know that his father dying in 1980 affected him. He took that hard, but he still had his mother and his sister. If we're to believe that interview he did with his friend, they were supportive of him. He loved them and they loved him. So what is the whole thing about him like basically just throwing everything away? And then why did he throw it away if he was just gonna be sitting on the couch waiting by the phone at the end of his life, waiting for somebody to give him a chance? What chance, sir? You had your chance. You messed that chance up. Carol O'Connor fought for you over and over and over and over if the stuff is to be believed. So what the whole thing is just iffy to me like this video is probably more of me talking than his story i'm sorry if y'all ain't interested in what i got to say but i just got to get it off my chest like the other ones that i've done have been pretty cut and dry they uh started acting singing whatever they kind of got off on the wrong path you know but this one feels like it was a forceful like you know what i'm saying like he made himself get on the wrong track you know it don't really seem like a mistake 
it's just weird to me it's awkward y'all go ahead and put in the comments your feelings also put in the comments if you have more details about his story because it's very vague to me seems like we're missing some pieces some pieces that might answer why he was so determined to steer his career off track you guys go ahead and like share comment this is ashley with ashley says so and i will be back with another video soon love you guys bye